fellow believers, welcome to the Just Praise Him radio show. I'll be recording this uh, episode in video as well as in audio, so you may hear me talking to both listeners and viewers. Today is March 4th, 2019. And we're going to talk about spiritual warfare today. Particularly, I want to give you some tips that I don't, some of them I don't think I've shared before, and just some basics. Because I have been surprised uh, while working on High Place Warriors by the number of people who don't understand the very basic elements of spiritual warfare. And I think that's because there's such a, a great a void where teaching is concerned. So I was standing at my window and drinking coffee the other day and just thinking about how bad the world has gotten, how, how much evil there is, you know, how sin has taken over everything and everybody, and it just, it just grieves me. You know, I don't like the world anymore. And I grew up in a much simpler, more moral time than this. I've lived almost six decades, and... You know, you look back on that and you, you knew how it was then and the people older than me, God bless them because they knew how it was even in a simpler, more moral time than when I grew up. I was born in 1960, so uh, I grew up in the you know, 60s and the 70s and, and it wasn't nearly as bad as it is now. It was going bad, but it wasn't nearly this bad, y'all. I mean, for real, it was, uh. Anyway, it got me to thinking, why did it get so bad so fast? Why did that happen? And why, you know, we keep doing things that we think will help, but it doesn't seem to be getting helped. And I believe the reason that sin is so rampant is the twisted cord of iniquity has multiplied with every generation. Um, I studied iniquity once years ago, and I'm not, I don't have a, a revelation from God about the definition of iniquity. I asked Nicole what she thought she had heard a man teach on it, and she said iniquity was our generational tendency to a sin. Um, like like uh, drug abuse or something like that. If your father or forefathers were addicted to drugs, abused drugs, you have a greater tendency to get into that kind of lifestyle. And if you do get into it and you just do it, then that is, is what she described. She believed iniquity was after hearing that teaching. So I studied iniquity years ago, and the word iniquity came from a word that meant to twist, like a cord, just twist. Like if you took a piece of rope and you started back here and you twisted it, and with each generation, you twisted it again, and you twisted it again. I mean, there's been a lot of generations between, you know, Adam and now, if you think about that. You know how twisted it would be now? And each time it twists, it multiplies. And what I deduced was that the wicked behavior that existed, you know, with our forefathers becomes more and more twisted with each generation. It becomes more and more perverse with each generation. And this, if we don't repent, iniquity is not removed from us, then it doesn't get any better no matter what else you do. If you, uh, let's say that you have a machine that's spewing out mud onto your floor. It's just spewing out mud onto your floor. And you keep going behind it and trying to mop it up and sweep it up, but the machine keeps spitting it out. If the machine is not turned off, you're still going to have a dirty floor, right? Okay, that's probably not a great analogy, but... So in light of the fact of the increasing evil that we see not getting better, and in fact only getting worse, um, I wanted to share some tips on spiritual warfare with you. And because more and more demons are going to be around us, and what the Lord showed me when I was moving to Arkansas is that they are going to manifest right in front of you. So if you don't know spiritual warfare... It, that's going to be an issue for you. There are not very many churches that believe in, practice, or teach on spiritual warfare. And part of that is they don't believe in it. And part of it is uh, it is very labor-intensive. In order to have a deliverance team in a church, you need about four to six people. I, I wouldn't do deliverance on somebody seriously demonized without at least three. And really, you should have at least four. Because with people that are extremely demonized, my experience has been somebody has to hold them down. I used to be the person that had to help hold them down in some of the meetings. 
and it's noisy, it's messy, and it's ugly. Some people get very sick when they're being delivered. There's all kind of, they scream, there's all kind of stuff that goes on. It's not, it's not a cut and dried thing where it's just simple and you just, oh, you command the demon to go and it goes and oh, their life has changed forever. It's not quite that simple. And you can see that if you read the accounts of when Jesus cast out demons, you can see that there too. Uh, the demons manifested and they, we call it showboating. You know, they're showing they're there. But, so there's a great need for spiritual warfare teaching. There's a great void of teaching. Um, and if people don't understand how to get people free, you can't help the people in your family. You can't help yourself. You're, it's likely that if you have demons on you now, you are not going to be able to find anyone to help you with that. Okay? And... When I realized I had demonic influences on me, I started learning about spiritual warfare so I could try to help myself, and that worked. And that's the way I did it. I did get some help with a few of them, but the majority of them, I just kept beseeching the Lord, Lord, show me what this is. Show me what's there. Give me some help here. And He helped me, and He taught me, and He led me to things in the Word so that I was able to practice self-deliverance and get free. Thank God. Praise God. So it took me, <laughs> doing that took me most of a decade to get to learn that stuff and get most of the way free. It's not fast. I mean, if you, I sinned full time for 36 years. I mean, what can I say? There were a lot of demons there. I practiced witchcraft. I was in the occult two different times in my life. And one time for years, very, you know, intense, very intense interest in it, studying it and all that. So there were a lot of demons there. Plus, there was all the generational stuff, and I had to learn about that too. So it took me most of a decade to get free of most of it. Deliverance, if you have a lot of demons, is a process. It's like a journey. You start here, and you know, eventually you end up here, but there's some bumps in the road. You know, you've got to learn as you go. And as I began to study spiritual warfare and learn what to do and how to get free, I came under attack. The demons came after me. They came after me pretty bad in some, some cases. Um, I remember seeing a giant snake demon come after me, and I can't remember what else. I remember the snake demon because he was really big, and I was traveling. That was in about uh, 2007, I think, that that happened. And it came into the motel room where I was. So that was interesting. But some people, because they know they'll get attacked, won't do deliverance because they're afraid of the devil. We have no business being afraid of the devil. Can I just tell you that? If you fear something, you are in effect worshiping its power. You are reverencing its power. And that is a form of worship. So do not fear the devil and do not fear the demons. You have authority over them. Did you know they fear you? They fear you if you're a Christian because they know your authority. Even if you don't, they know your authority. And so they try to bully you and tell you that they're going to attack you if you do this or you do that. And you should just laugh at them. They can't, it's, you can beat them up. Okay, so let me clue you in. If you're afraid of the devil, he's never going to leave you alone anyway, whether you learn about spiritual warfare or you don't. He hates you. He hates all of us. He wants to destroy us in the most painful, prolonged way possible, and he is not going to leave you alone. So you might as well get some payback. That's the way I look at it. Okay, now, God bless them. The people signing up for High Place Warriors, they are taking some hits, y'all. They are taking some hits. And we got, we have um, a VIP prayer team that prays for them when they come under serious attack. Uh, we have multiple people we contact when somebody comes under a bad attack to get them help. We've had a couple of people who signed up. One just psh, disappeared, and she was so excited about what we were doing, and she just went, I mean, she just went, I don't think she's ghosting us because she's a very mature military veteran. So she's not ghosting us. I think the devil hit her with something. And another one, an, an older lady, oh, so precious. I wish that she lived somewhere close to me so I could go check on her and drink coffee with her. So precious. And a warrior in her 80s, never fell before in her life, fell three times in the last month after signing up. And the last time she fell, split her head open. And her, said bruised so bad that her whole face turned black. Now she's gone silent, and I'm, I'm concerned about that. I, she could be in a hospital, I don't know, but I, I mean, they are getting hit. One man got hit with a heart attack. Uh, it was his fifth heart attack, and you would think, okay, well, he just got a bad heart. Well, the Lord knew he would think that. 
And so when they were taking him into emergency, into putting him into the hospital, a security guard counted the money in his wallet in front of him. It was exactly $666. You can never convince me that is not God telling him, hey, I didn't do this and your heart didn't do this. That was Satan. You can't tell me anything else. I won't believe it. So, a lot of people are getting hit and they're emailing. People are getting hit with real bad illnesses and they're just, they're just going down and they're writing just short emails. Please, please pray for me and I'm down. And so we put out a, we, we call them fire alarms. We put out a fire alarm. You know, we got an intercessor down, we got a warrior down and all the people start praying to get them back up on their feet. Okay, so you're going to come under attack. Going towards the end of the end, it is going to get a lot worse. And let me tell y'all something. I did not plan to make this video today. I don't know who this is for, but somebody needs to hear this, and you needed to hear it in video form, apparently, because I was just going to record an audio podcast. Um, I, I do videos every now and then, but it takes a lot of work to get me decent enough to put me in front of a camera. So I don't want to come on here looking, you know, like a homeless person. Nothing against the homeless. All right, so let's talk about spiritual warfare basics. But anyway, I know this video is for somebody, so. Number one, the basis of spiritual warfare is your ability to command demons is based on you being a child of God. That means you being saved. That means you are saved and redeemed by the blood of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. Okay, That is the basis of your authority. If you are not saved, you have zero authority to command demons, period. Okay, let me talk a minute about authority. I don't have any great analogy for this. The only thing I can think of is if when you're married to somebody, when I was married to my husband, uh, I could sign checks. I, I paid our bills with uh, my first husband, Rick. He didn't like to do write checks, and he didn't like to do all the bill pay and all that, so I did all that. I could write his name. I could sign his name. I could do you know all of those kind of things in his name because I was his wife. I could drive his car because I was his wife. I could live in his house because I was his wife. Okay, So I had authority based on the fact that I was married to him. I was in covenant with him. We are married to Jesus. We are in covenant with with Jesus. We have authority to use the name of Jesus and command demons by virtue of that relationship and our salvation which makes us a child of God and a bride to Jesus Christ. Okay? Alright. That's why the demons can't refuse to, to do what you say as long as what you command them is, is what you're supposed to be commanding. Um... The name of Jesus, the Bible says, is above all names. There is no name higher than Jesus. He is the top. He is the very top. Okay, when you begin practicing spiritual warfare, the first temptation that will come for you is pride. You'll think, oh, well, you know, I can do this, I can do that. Remember when the disciples started rejoicing that the demons had to do what they said? And the Lord told them, don't rejoice about that. Rejoice that you're saved. Okay. You are not somebody because you can cast out a demon. Can I just tell you that? That does not make you somebody. You are not doing that under your own power or your own authority. You are doing it by virtue of the authority of the name of Jesus. You can rejoice in Him, but you cannot rejoice in your own power to do that. So let's just be sure we understand that. Pride will get you in so much trouble so fast that you will not even hear the door slam shut. I just did a podcast on that. Okay. When you enter into spiritual warfare or start learning about it, the first fight you must fight is the fight against sin in your own life. You do not want to go into spiritual warfare when you've got sin. Not that we're ever perfect, but we should be continually, truly repentant. To repent means to be sorry and to turn and go the other direction and stop doing what you were doing. If you were just saying the words, Oh Lord, I'm sorry I did that, but you know you're going to do it again that night or the next day, you're not sorry and you're not repenting. Okay, that's not repentance. God doesn't want to hear lip service. He wants to see life service. He wants to see change. You're not repenting if you are just saying the words. Please hear me on this. It's very important. Because if you go into spiritual warfare and you got a bunch of sin, those demons will call you out. Did you know that? They can call you out on that. It happens. It sure happens. Okay. 
The first fight you always fight is the fight against sin in your own life in your own household if you're the head of the household but definitely in your own life don't go playing around with demons it ain't it ain't no game y'all they will manifest I've seen many of them manifest they will manifest and they will do some interesting things okay if you get del delivered from a demon let's say a demon of anger uh, it suddenly you're you're free. all of a sudden you're not getting angry all the time you're not blowing up all the time okay and then about a week or two later you're tempted to get angry again. Really, somebody really did something to you and you're just really tempted to just let them have it, right? If you take that temptation, guess what? If you do it even one more time, guess what? That demon comes back and not only does he come back, but he brings friends, okay? When you see someone who has a demon, getting them delivered is not always what you need to do, all right? Please hear me on this. It's very important. It's not always the best option because if they are not committed to walk in purity, you will hurt them. All right? Because the demon you cast out will just come back with seven more wicked. If they're not ready to give that sin up and they go out and they sin, let's say you deliver them in church, you're so happy, they got free, they're excited, they walk out the door and an hour later they do the same sin again, here comes that demon back and he brings seven of his buddies with him, okay? And what that means is, for every demon you cast out, they get eight. You cast out seven demons, here come 56, they've got 56 an hour later. You will hurt them. This rule is the same for self-deliverance. Years ago, when I lived in Princeton in the old house, there was uh, when I first began doing ministry and teaching on spiritual warfare, there was a, a young man who called me up. He lived in East Dallas, and he, and he just begged me for help. He contacted me online, and, and I contacted him by phone. And uh, he would, I, I let him contact me, and, and he's please help me get delivered. He was in the gay lifestyle, and he wanted help. And so... You know, I helped him. I did it a couple of times. And then the next time, he got to where he would call every week, ask him for deliverance. And so the next time he called, I was fixing a cast out. I said, okay, tell me what's happening. Tell me the symptoms you're having, all that. And he told me, and I started to cast the demon out, and the Lord said, stop. And I'm like, did you say stop, Lord? Why do you want me to stop? And he said, you're going to hurt him. And I said, Why? You know, I'm just talking to God privately in my heart. I'm not saying it out loud. And he said, because he's not ready to give up the sin. And I said, I'm sorry, man, I can't do it. And I told him what happened. And he said, okay. And he said that the Lord had given him a word through a prophet that he knew. That if he went back to that lifestyle again, he was going to kill him. I got a letter from him about two years ago from, that he wrote from his deathbed. I know he's gone now. God's not playing. And he won't play with your sin. And you're not going to stand up in church. And this man led worship. You're not going to stand up in church and act like you're Christian and then go out and live like the devil behind the scenes and God not call you out. Okay? He'll call you out. And I'll tell you something else too. God will call you out in your congregation. He will. This is a word. For, oh, Lord. Oh, this may be why the video. Okay, Lord. There's a man, you're watching this video, and you are having an affair behind your wife's back. And you're getting into some pretty perverse things. And the Lord says to tell you, sir, if you don't give up that other woman, he's going to call you out in the congregation in front of the whole church. He's going to send a prophet to that church. It's going to be somebody you don't know. And he's going to show them everything you're doing. And he's going to have them call you out in front of the church and name your sins. He does not want to do this, but he said you're hurting your wife. He said you're damaging your marriage. Apparently you had a really good marriage for a long time and nothing like this has happened. And you just gave in to temptation. And the Lord says to tell you, I'll fix your marriage if you let me fix it. But if you try to fix what's wrong by going outside the marriage, he said, I'll destroy you. He said, I'll destroy you. He's not playing. If you don't give it up, I see you being called out in front of the church. You're a nice looking man. 
You'll be called out in front of the church. Your sins will be damned. Your wife will divorce you and she will take 60% of everything you own. And she will take 60% of your future earnings and God will tear up your business. He will tear it down. There will be nothing left. He said he will destroy you. Okay. Moving right along. Don't play with God, y'all. Don't play with him now. If he's blessed you, you better be living right. He can take those blessings in it. One second he can take them. One second. Okay. So when you see somebody's got a demon, it's not always the best option to try to do deliverance on them. You pray about that. You ask the Lord. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he finds it empty and swept and garnished. Then he goes out and he takes with himself seven spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. That is Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 to 45. That's the seven spirits more wicked. Spirits nest up like that because they are they're building a stronghold. It's like a little fort. I'm going to do a teaching um, that I've got written out and haven't done yet on spiritual warfare where I'm going to describe to you what spiritual warfare is like, what it's like when you're fighting a battle like that. Um, and it's written kind of with a, a viewpoint of humor because I, I like to teach with humor because you remember it better and I like to teach with stories because they're easier, it's easier to remember what you learn. Most of the time you go to a church and you walk out and 10 minutes later you can't even remember what the sermon was about. That's not helpful. You should be thinking about those all day and all that week. You should be thinking about what the sermon was about. If you can't even remember it, you didn't get anything out of it. So, it's not surprising then that a lot of people go to the internet for teaching, and I did too. Um, I want to teach you that, and I want to show you, for those of you who have never done it, I want to show you a picture of what warfare looks like. What it, This is just a typical warfare scenario. And so I've got that all written out, and I'll probably teach that next. Okay. Let me find my place here, y'all. One of the things that we deal with when we're doing spiritual warfare is we will deal with demonic presences coming into our homes. Uh, this has been happening to me a bunch since the whole High Place Warriors thing started up. They have <laughs> The Lord stationed this really large angel in my living room and uh, it's pretty funny because I can feel when the demons come in. and the, the last ones that came in, there were three, and, and they're really big ones. One of them was huge. And they were here for about one second, and about the time I was going to look up, I, they were just gone. And I was like, yeah, that angel just batted them out of the field like, Puh, you're gone. So I thought that was pretty funny. But um, I'm going to tell you all something that will help a lot with demonic presences in your house. So the last five or six weeks since High Place Warrior started, and I always command the demons to leave when I know they're around because I don't want them around me. They're not allowed to be around us. But there are ways that you can make your home very uninviting to demons. And I especially recommend that if you have a child who's being plagued with demons or demonic nightmares or anything like that. If you are having a problem with a demonic presence in your house, when I moved into this house where I'm at in Arkansas, this is the second house I lived in. I lived in a little small one out in the country, the one that had the snakes come up on the porch, that one that had the snake. Um, this one had a resident demon in the basement. There was a demon that lived in a dark corner down there in the basement, and I wasn't the only one who knew it was there. The pastors that I used to be friends with... Um, they knew it was there. God showed them it was there, showed them where it was, everything. They came over here one day and said, there's a demon in your basement. We're here to take care of it. I said, Psh, come on in. You know, I had been fighting that thing ever since I moved in. So <laughs> I ended up doing something like this to it, and it left. Um, if you're having a problem with demonic presence in your house, turn on music about the blood of Jesus. There, is, there are playlists on YouTube. My favorite one has 500 songs about the blood. So when the demons get on my nerves or when I feel like worshiping, I turn that on and turn it up. 
and it's hilarious to see what they do when they're in the house. Um, I turned it on one day about three weeks ago. I was just coming under a heavy attack because of high place warriors and I knew they were coming around and I knew there were some around me but they weren't big ones and I was walking to the kitchen to do something and I was like I am so tired of messing with them you know because I was already I, I've been pulling minimum 12 hours a day minimum since January 23rd and I finished the database work yesterday thank you Jesus that was that was the 12 hour a day thing so it's going to get better now but that was, I was so tired and just, you know, tired of dealing with all that. But when God asks you to do something, you do it. So I thought, I thought, okay, fine. Y'all are in my house. Here's what we're going to do. And I walked over to my computer and I turned on, I went to YouTube and I found that, that playlist of 500 songs about the blood of Jesus and I turned it up and I hit play. <laughs> and I literally saw, there were three demons in my living room. I literally saw them run through the wall. And my dogs were out in the... Uh, the area that adjoins the kitchen, which adjoins a, like a sunroom kind of room that I don't use because it's got a leak and all kind of problems. But they saw the demons run out and they went nuts. I mean, they went nuts. They ran over to the windows that overlooked the backyard. That's where the demons went. They, they just went crazy. And I looked out there. I thought, are they barking at something else? And I looked out. There was nothing else out there. They were barking because they saw the demons. And I have one dog that if he sees anybody run, he assumes they're up to no good and he'll just go crazy. They went bananas. I'm like, okay, well, I know how to get rid of you guys now. So, um, music about the blood of Jesus. Keep it playing. And it will cause a peace to come over your house that is just so calming and so wonderful that you will just love that. If you have a child who's being affected, they're seeing things or... Um, see, I grew up seeing things that nobody else saw and nobody, everybody thought I was weird and I'm like, you know, maybe it's a gift or something and we don't know. It did turn out to be a gift. It was God's anointing to do this kind of work. But we didn't know that then. It was, I guess, discernment. We um, lived in old, old farmhouses where people probably died and all kind of stuff. So it's probably not really that surprising that I saw stuff. I'm sure that they had all kind of demonic stuff in them. Okay, here's another thing to keep in mind when you're doing deliverance and you're, when you're trying to get your healing to manifest. If you do spiritual warfare against something and it does not stop or get better, then the problem is not demonic. Assuming you're doing the warfare correctly. Okay? If it does not stop or get better and you're doing the warfare right then that problem you are trying to attack is not demonic in nature. Look for a natural cause. It is not demonic. Uh, example. You cannot... It, example about doing warfare wrong. Uh, Lord, please bind up those demons. He's not going to bind up the demons. He left you the power to bind and loose. He's not going to bind... He already did his part. He has already done his part. You have to do your part. Um... The Lord rebuke you. Wrong. Jesus rebuked the demons directly, and you will too if you want to get any results. Otherwise, you won't get any results, okay? Um, I've talked about this before. John Paul, John, John's, John Paul, <laughs> John Paul Jackson's book, Needless Casualties of War or something like that, where he talked about having respect for their office and all this and saying the Lord rebuke you and all that. He said that even the angels said the Lord rebuke you. The angels said the Lord rebuke you because the angels are not heirs of salvation. They don't have the right to use the name of Jesus like we do. Okay? All right. Look at the way Jesus did deliverance. He cast the demons out and told them to leave. Okay. Here's another. This is a spiritual law. You cannot deliver someone of a demon they want to keep. There's one example better than any I can think of is the demon Jezebel. She is the vilest, most horrible spirit that I've ever encountered anywhere. And I have never found anyone who had a strong manifestation of Jezebel who wanted to be delivered. Okay? It is unlikely that I ever will. Um, the only thing I've ever found that works with Jezebel is to get as far away from her as you can and cut all ties. I found nothing else that works to get you any relief at all. And that doesn't even always work, but it helps. Okay, if someone has a demon and they do not want you to do deliverance, you cannot cast those demons out because they want to keep them and they have a right to keep their demons if they want them. It's a choice. 
Um, let's say you have a child who's addicted to drugs. Let's say the Lord has shown you a spirit of addiction or something like that, and you want, and I've seen that spirit, so there is one. And so you want to cast that demon out. So you go to cast that out, and they go, no, I don't want you to do that, because you know they like their drug that they do. You can't do it. You cannot stop right there because your commands are worthless if they don't want to be delivered. Can I just tell you that? They are worthless. They will, they will get you no result. Now what you can do is if that child lives in your house, under your roof, and you are the spiritual head of the house, is you can pray. You don't need to be around them when you do this. You can pray and bind up the actions of that demon whenever it is under your roof. Uh, you can ask for angels to torment those demons when they're under your roof. You can do things like that, but you cannot cast it out if they want to keep it. You can pray and ask the Lord to give that child a great desire to be drug-free and live a godly life. You can do that. And those are the kind. And, and I would pray Psalm 91 over that child every single day. Okay. The reason that we can never get into pride over being able to cast out demons is shown in Acts chapter 19. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out from them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits. So they took it upon themselves to try to do deliverance too, because they saw what was happening. And and the evil spirit answered back and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Because they tried to cast them out saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. You know why they couldn't do that? Because they didn't know the Jesus that Paul preached about. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. That's serious. They did not know Jesus. They were not saved. They had no authority. But we have nothing to be prideful about because it is only by the blood of Jesus and his sacrifice that we can do anything with demons. Okay. Protection from attacks. Let's talk about that. You need to know about being protected from attacks now and in what's coming. Okay, because it's just going to get worse and worse. And I, it grieves me, y'all. I can feel it in my spirit that it's close. And I'm fixing to tell you something that really has, has just kind of blown me away for the last two or three days ever since I heard it from my friend. One of the reasons that I wanted to share these spiritual warfare tips with you is because things are fixing to get bad. Uh, I have an old warrior friend here in this town. He's an, uh, an intercessor from way back. He's older than I am. He's uh, very anointed. Um, he spends hours and hours with the Holy Spirit every single day and praying to the Lord and praying for people. He went to a nearby town the other day to get something. And he stopped to put gas in his vehicle. And as he walked inside to pay for his gas, um, the Lord pointed someone out to him. It was a young man. About He said the man looked about 22, maybe. And the Lord spoke to him, and he said, uh, I want you to go give him this message when you come back out of there. He goes, okay. And so he went in. There's this long line of people, and he thought, yeah, that guy will be gone before I get out. And the Lord uses him this way all the time. The Lord was not gone before. I mean, the guy was not gone when he came out. So he goes out, and he walks up to the guy, and he said, The Lord said to tell you that you're going to fight in World War III. I'm sure I don't have to tell you all how bad World War III is going to be. If that young man, let's say that he's 22, if they instituted a draft, they would take the people between 22 and either 30 or 40, most likely. So that tells you how soon war is going to come. And you know, God's given me, I don't know how many words about war coming to America in the last two or three years that are on JustPraiseHim.today. So I was like, wow, 
Wow. Okay, so where safety can be found. <clears throat> when the Lord asked me to raise up this army of prayer warriors, um, I knew, I knew that they would come under attack and I began asking them, I said, Lord, I said, I need a prayer of protection. They can pray over themselves because we both know they're going to, you know, they're going to get hit. And he answered me immediately and he said, Psalm 91. And I was like, okay, all righty then. So I wrote out a personal adaption for a person to pray over themselves uh, and sent it out to everybody with instructions to pray it daily over themselves and over the people that they love. I also prayed over myself and the people that I love. In 1996, within a month of giving my life to Jesus, something really awful happened to someone I loved. And I was working on a seismic job in Chickasha, Oklahoma. And it was very late at night. I think it was about midnight when I got the message that it had happened. I got a phone call. I was devastated. I knew no scripture then. Like none. I mean none. Um... I don't think I could have quoted you a single verse except maybe uh, it's more blessed to give than receive or ask and you will receive and maybe do unto others. I could quote you parts of those because I'd heard those my whole life. I didn't know God yet. I knew that I had found the truth, but um, I didn't know him. He had just given me a new job that I had asked for and I was in the, the process of, I was in an apartment there and I was in the process of packing up this apartment and making the transition from one job to another and I was going to be going to another state. I was going to uh, from Oklahoma to South Louisiana. So I got the news, and, though, and I wanted desperately to go to my family member, but I couldn't because the only vehicle I had was my company truck, and you weren't allowed to take it for anything personal without getting prior permission, and I would break that rule even under this circumstance. So I couldn't leave until daylight when I could go and get permission. So... I was in so much pain after I heard. I was in so hole. Oh, it was so bad. All I could do was lay on my bed and stare at the ceiling. That's all I could do. I, I, you just, when you get news that's that bad, you just don't function. You just stop. So I'm laying there, and I'm waiting for daylight, and I'm staring at the ceiling, and I'm praying. I don't even know how to pray at that point. I'm asking, and I'm begging, because, you know, I didn't know how to pray the word or anything. I didn't, I didn't know any word. And suddenly, as I prayed... I felt feathers. I felt feathers on me. I didn't know the words, so I didn't know that Psalm 91 4 says, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth will be your shield and buckler. I didn't know that then. And so Psalm 91 is very important to me because he showed me Psalm 91 and what he did before I ever found it. It was two years before I found that verse, and I was like, oh. He was there. No, it was about a year when I got when the word opened up to me, and I just devoured it night and day. It was about a year because 1997 was when he opened the word to me. So even though I did not even know God that night, hardly at all, I'd only given him my life. Even though I didn't know his word, he heard the cries of his heartbroken child, and he'll hear your cries too. And he covered me with his feathers. And he shielded me under his wings so that I could survive what happened. So I want to share something else with you. I pray Psalm 91 every day in my protection prayers. Um, and, and as I was praying Psalm 91 on Saturday, March 2nd, just this past Saturday, day before yesterday, I had just gotten to the part only with your eyes only with our eyes will we behold and see the reward of the wicked because we have made the Lord our refuge. Even the Most High, our habitation, there shall no evil befall us. And then I saw a vision, y'all. And I saw the Lord. And we were like tiny babies and He was holding us like this. That when we pray that prayer, this is how He does with us. He holds us like that. And when we are in our Father's arms, there is nothing that can touch us. Nothing. And that's what that psalm means. When we pray that, that's what that means. He's going to hold you like this and He's going to protect you and you're going to be okay. And He's going to do that for your loved ones too if you pray that for them. And I think I put the Psalm 91 adaption out on my uh, on the prayers tab of the JustPraiseHim.today site. But if I didn't and somebody wants it, I'll put it out there. But that, that prayer is the protection over everything. It names like everything in there. And I think it was Perry Stone that did a teaching one time on television about Psalm 91. 
and he it was him or somebody they showed the Hebrew words the Hebrew words that made up Psalm 91 because it's in the Old Testament and they had these little spears on them and he said look weapon 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 he said the whole psalm is a weapon and I love that that's really stuck with me okay I want to read y'all this fantastic story there is a book uh, called Psalm 91 real life stories of God's shield of protection and what this psalm means for you and those you love. It's by Peggy Joyce Ruth. And it's out there on the Just Praise Him site in the print books tab. Listen to this story. I love this. The power of Psalm 91. When a Pennsylvania lieutenant was accidentally discovered by the enemy while attempting to carry out a very important overseas mission, he immediately placed himself in the hands of God. But all he could get out of his mouth was, Lord, it's up to you now. Before... He had a chance to defend himself. The enemy shot point blank, striking him in the chest and knocking him flat on his back. Thinking he was dead, his buddy grabbed the, the carbine, the rifle, out of his hands, paired it up with his own, and began blasting away with both guns. When his friend finished, not one enemy was left. Later, the lieutenant's sister in Pennsylvania got a letter relating this amazing story. The force of that bullet in the chest had only stunned her brother. Without thinking, he reached for the wound, but instead he felt his Bible in his pocket. Pulling it out, he found an ugly hole in the cover. The Bible car carried had shielded his heart. The bullet had ripped through Genesis, Exodus, and had kept going through book after book, stopping in the middle of the 91st Psalm, pointing like a finger at verse 7. A, th a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. The lieutenant exclaimed, I did not even know that verse was in the Bible, but precious God, thank you for it. He did not even realize that protection psalm was there. Is that not the most amazing? I love that story. I just love that story. I, <laughs> psalm 91 is special, y'all. I'm telling you, it is, it is just special. Um, somebody wrote me, I don't remember, one or two of y'all have written me and asked, if I had written any books on spiritual warfare, really I haven't other than Loose from Chains of Darkness about breaking generational curses, but, and about breaking other curses, but um, on the JPH side in the print books tab, I went and added some books for those of you who are looking for them. These are the ones that I go to. One is Richard Ng's Spiritual Warfare. That is my favorite book on spiritual warfare in all the world. Another one is by Don Dickerman called When Pigs Move In. How to Sweep Clean the Demonic Influences Impacting Your Life and the Lives of Others. I read that some years back and thought it was very good. So those are in the JPH print books tab if you want to, uh, justpraisehim.today, if, if you are looking for books on spiritual warfare, those are the ones I recommend. Okay. Let's talk about where you send demons when you cast them out. Years back, I can't remember what year it was, might have been 2008. I can't remember. I was in Woodward. Uh, there was this young couple, and I was trying to help them. And I was casting some demons out of them in their house. And the Lord opened my eyes. I just cast out two demons out of this young man, and the Lord opened my eyes. And those demons were still in the room. And they were pacing back and forth. They were like this, pacing, alternating each other. The, and they were looking for a chance to get back in. And I was like, what on earth? And the Lord taught me from that that when we cast them out, we need to really tell them where to go. Or that's the way I took it. Uh, we don't want them staying in, you know, in the same room. There's a book by Howard Pittman, very old, very small book, where he tells uh, of a time when God opened his eyes, and he saw a vision of there was this demon watching this man. And he was trying, he want, see, they want to attach to us, because otherwise they got to go live down there. they got to live in hell, and they got to walk through dry places. But if they attach to us, they get to enjoy all the comforts we enjoy. And they get to work out their nature through us. If they're a demon of lust, they get to fulfill their lust through our bodies. If they're a demon of anger, they get to express their anger through our bodies. And they, and they cause all this destruction in our lives while they're doing it. So we don't want them. So Howard Pittman saw this demon looking for... He was trying to get in, attached to this man, and so he would put a tempting thought in this man's mind. And finally, he put a tempting thought, and the man started to think on it, like, yeah, maybe I'll do that, and boom, the demon entered him right then. That's how that works. When you cast a demon out, I believe that you need to tell it to go to a specific place. Um, 
We don't have the authority to command them to judgment. Only Jesus can do that. However, I think we can believe, I, I think that we can send them away to await their judgment. And that's what I, I personally do. Um, you know, there's this, there's this verse in Matthew chapter 8. And when he was come to the other side, talking about Jesus, into the country of Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs. One of the other gospels says one. Exceeding fear so that no man might, might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out saying, what have, you, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Now why would they say to torment us? Unless he had the ability to torment them. And what Jesus had the ability to do while he was on earth, we also have the ability to do. So we can torture demons. Isn't that good news? I was happy to hear that. Um, and when I found out, the first one I went after was Python. I had help casting out Python one night. I was on the phone with my friend. And got it cast out. I'm just standing there just continuing to talk after it's done. And I turned around because I was standing up when I did it, of course. Turned around and, and I had just been praying, Lord, can we really, you know, can we really, because I think he was teaching me that you could torture demons. And um, I was like, Lord, can we really do all that? Because I had done it to the snake. I had stabbed it and sliced it and beat it up with my sword and all this. And I'm just talking on the phone and I turn around and God opens my eyes in the spirit and there's this giant snake mangled and chopped up on my floor with stab marks in it and cut marks in it. And I was like, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We can torture him. It's on like Donkey Kong. And it's been on ever since then. Okay, so what I do, and you can do what you want. What I used to do was just command them to go to the abyss. But now I have a little bit more fun with it. Now, uh, Nicole taught me that she listens to, I think it's Pat Halliday that she listens to that says that she cages demons. She puts them in cages. And then she asks for angels to be dispatched to carry the cages to the feet of Jesus. Well, I wanted them to be tortured a little more than that. So I kick them into the cages and stomp on them and cut off their heads and stuff. And I cut them off from all their power. And then I command them to look on the face of Jesus the whole time while they're awaiting their judgment. Hopefully a very long time. And they have to listen to the worship of the angels and the praise of Jesus from the angels in heaven. And they have to contemplate the crucifixion and the resurrection and the redeeming power of the blood of Jesus. I think that's far more fun. And then I lock the cage and off it goes. You can think up your own tortures for them. Uh, get some payback. They've done a lot to you and to your family. They've done a lot to me and my family. That's why I do it. I'm like, it's payback time now. It's on. Okay. I discovered something recently. I want to share this with y'all because this is a spiritual law too that keeps us stuck. Uh, anytime we rebel, we rebel against the rules, we rebel against what is a better choice for us, we rebel against God's commandments, we get into rebellion and it brings a curse. Okay? And it will keep you stuck in something and it will keep you from being able to get delivered of something. Even if you fix everything else, if you don't repent for the rebellion, and be truly sorry, not just say the words, because repentance is turning and going the other way, then you won't get any better. And incidentally, rebellion is also the wrong use of anything. Okay? Anything that rebels against what is natural and right and the proper use that God gave us of something is rebellion. The Lord told me that rebellion always brings a curse. He taught me that. And we know a curse always keeps you stuck because the rule is a curse continues until somebody has the knowledge and breaks it. Um, okay, so whenever you're stuck and, you, and you're not getting delivered from something, be sure to look for rebellion. Consider the fact that it may be natural and cause whatever you're trying to cast out, whatever the symptoms are you're having. It may be a natural cause and not demonic if you're doing warfare and it's not getting better. And look for anything about rebellion. Because if you repent for the rebellion, and that was what was keeping you stuck, you will have immediate improvement. All right. One more thing, and then I'm going to close this. I believe that Satan is constantly issuing new assignments against us. An assignment is a, a command. He'll take a group of demons and he'll say, okay, I want you to attack their finances or attack that one's ministry or attack that one in her or his body or something like that. Those are assignments. There are people who say that Satan issues assignments at 3 a.m. every morning. I don't have any idea if that's true. I've not found any.